So as I said, I, I've been working on tsunami science for quite a while, um, since the mid-1990s. Um, done a lot of uh, background field work in um, tsunami hazards and uh, actually investigating the effects on the ground uh, right after a tsunami happens. Um, specializing in sort of the numerical modeling, so the inundation, and that's what we're going to be talking about. And so a few years back, working with Murray, we um, did the uh, inundation assessment to define the evacuation zones, which led to the red, uh, orange, and yellow maps that you, um, that you uh, saw before. So speaking of uh, natural disasters, um, my extended Fano right now back on the island of Puerto Rico is under a hurricane and they're all sitting in the dark because the power is out on the entire island. So these sorts of things, you know, happen to lots of different communities around the world. Um, our, our hazard here is, is not an annual hazard like a hurricane. It's one of these long-term uh, things, but we have the annual events like cyclones and big rain events as well, as we saw last year. Um, so our project brief back in the, in the to do the inundation modeling was to define the three hazard zones as per the direct DGL, the director's guidelines for tsunami evacuation zones. So the first zone is the red, which is the marine and beach exclusion zone. And these are areas that can be designated off limits um, for any expected event. That's the, you know, the zone we're sitting in right now. It's the highest risk zone, so it's gonna be hit by the most, uh, potentially by the most amount of tsunamis over, over time. And um, you can expect this zone to be activated multiple times in your lifetime. So any, any moderate to big event is going to um, trigger an evacuation or, um, for that zone. The intermediate area is the orange zone. And this is the area that will be evacuated in a distant or regional source official warning. Um, that extends beyond the red zone, and it's for tsunami sources with about with greater than one hour of travel time, so you've got a little bit more time to react, and for tsunami sources, you know, sort of on a 500-year time frame, um, it should also be tied to one of the threat levels. So the in turn, which is uh, related to a expected tsunami wave height offshore. The local differentiation of this zone can be achieved using terms that are familiar to the community. So things like you know a road, a particular road, or an intersection, or something, or a boundary um, that would be sort of um, well known. Um, the yellow zone should cover is the big one. That's the one that is for our worst case event covers the biggest area, and it should cover all maximum credible um, tsunami events and the highest impact events. The intent is that this yellow zone is for local source maximum credible events, and you know based on our local risk. And um, this is the play. This is the range you should aim to get out of in the local hazard, so the very strong shaking uh, that you feel locally that lasts a very long time. And um, coming from the probabilistic models, which were done by GNS, this would be related to the 2,500 year recurrence interval at the 84th percentile, meaning like the, the least likely of the, of the scenarios that were considered, but, but still considered to be possible. So, and also at the end of that, if you read through this, it's also the recommended minimum. So if things are even, could be conceivably worse, then you could even go bigger from that. So unfortunately, where, where we are is probably, you know, one of the places with the highest hazard in Aotearoa. Um, it, it's, um, it's just a fact that we're sitting so close to the subduction zone and we have the least amount of time to react if something big were to happen. The overall approach was we did it with a numerical model, so a computer model that, that takes a wave and forces it through um, uh, and calculates where, how high the water is going to be at each time step as you go through the model. It's what we call a level three methodology, so there's several different methodologies that you can use where this is the, one of the higher ones and it means you're using a physics-based computer model, you're actually modeling where the water would go, um, and you're, you're using a lot of different scenarios and you're trialing different things and you're modeling from an earthquake source right through to the inundation all in the same, um, in the same simulation. So of course to do this we have to define the source first of all. So um, how big do we want it to be? What do we want it to look like? And how much, uh, and how are we gonna put that into the model? 
So as we said before, the yellow zone is based on extreme near source events. The orange zone is based on distant source events. That's what we came to the conclusion. And then the red zone, we didn't really um, do it with modeling per se. We just basically used a, a, um, a height contour and defined that as the, the extent of the, of the red zone. So for the, in the yellow zone, the DGL says it should be defined in a way that encompasses the area expected to be inundated by the 2500 year event. Um, the time frame includes large subduction zone events. As Dave said that, um, you know, we don't know if, but, but uh, it's probable that, that if you wait long enough, a big earthquake can happen. And that waiting long enough means the order of you know, thousands of years. And again, to put it in perspective, the, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which was one of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded on Earth, right behind the Chile 1960, happened on a subduction zone where there is thousands of years of recorded history, and they'd never had an earthquake that big. And yet it popped off one of the biggest earthquakes ever to happen. So you know, people have been sailing those seas and writing things down and keeping track of what happened in the, in the Arabian Sea for several thousand years. And there was no record of an earthquake that big, nor a tsunami. So it happens. Same thing with the, the Hunga earth, uh, volcano that we just had. This is a volcano that erupted in such a way that there had been, there's only one historical analog that we know of from 1883 in the Indian Ocean. And there's never been anything like that, that, that we have concrete proof of happening in the Pacific Ocean for thousands of years. So again, this is you know one in many thousand year event. They happen. We've had two of these in our lifetime. So you know, don't, don't discount it. So um, in these events, too, they should be include the thinking of the Japan 2011 earthquake as a, as a source. And that's fairly, you know, that's pretty applicable to our situation where Japan happened. It was right offshore of, a, of, an, of an area. And I'll show that in a sec. Um, and so when you look at the, the probabilistic uh, curve, um, the middle one is the 50th percentile likelihood of occurrence, and the 84th is less likely. But the tsunami heights at the shoreline associated with that event at 2,500 years is somewhere around 14 meters at the shoreline. And if you look at the 500-year time frame, we're talking tsunami heights, depending on you know, what level of probability you want to think of, somewhere between uh, 6 and 9 meters. So these are big, big events. Um, of course, the, the one that is the, the worry is the, the Hikarangi subduction zone. The Hikarangi subduction zone, we've got the different segments of it. We're in the northern segment of that. And um, the, we're going to be looking at a, oops, uh, back. We're going to be looking at local earthquakes happening right offshore here. So in going through this, we did some sensitivity analysis. And firstly, I. Um, I, we were looking at one segment, so taking one section of the fault, we broke the fault up into, into 100 by 50 kilometer uh, chunks to, to do the modeling. It's from a, a global database of tsunami sources, but um, that size is sort of like the smallest that you would really start to worry about things happening. The 1947 earthquake, for example, would probably be about a quarter of that in terms of its, the extent of the rupture that happened in 1947, which still made a 10 to 15 meter tsunami up the coast, but its actual size of the earthquake in the area that it ruptured was probably about one fourth of one of those boxes. So a lot smaller. Um, but it's also a special earthquake, which we won't talk about. Uh, so we're looking first at, at something happening offshore about a magnitude eight, which is about five meters of slip. So the fault moves about five meters. And a magnitude 8.3, where the fault moves about 15 meters. And again, we're trying to target that 14 meter uh, height for this, our worst case scenario. And we see that you know something, it gives about two to three meters or along the Poverty Bay shore here. And um, with the bigger event, we're still in the three to six meter range, but we've got much bigger uh, tsunami heights further to the north on the, on the steeper open coast. So this is, this is sort of the scenario that we're working towards, more about 15 meters of slip on the earthquake fault uh, there. Um, but then we could think about, you know, that's, I, I showed that one, and it was out on the shallower section. So as, as we saw, the, the, 
the um, subduction zone dips or it's going underneath us and we're standing right about here somewhere and if you go straight down as Dave said the closest point to the subduction zone is actually directly below us but because um, it's at this very shallow angle coming underneath and if you have an event that ruptures out offshore in the shallower bits so that's the equivalent there's the, the the rupture area see it's at that very shallow angle coming into the into the earth and it's going to have a bit of a different shape than the one if it happens deeper. And what happens when it's deeper is that actually you get more localized deformation underneath it. So if you have a big rupture at the deeper part of the subduction zone, you're going to get um, subsidence where underneath on the coastline. So this whole area drops down for this particular scenario, you know, in the order of about a meter. So all that ground drops down. Now what happens when the ground drops down? Of course, the water flows in. And then um, that's not yet the tsunami, that's just the flooding that comes in because the ground subsided. Looking up, going back to these shallow, shallower ones offshore, so again, these are all with 15 meters of slip on the shallower segment further offshore. And here, what I was looking at was, um, what's the effect of changing the length of the rupture? So if you extend it to the south or extend it to the north or have all three going at the same time, but the end result really is that there's not much of a difference. And really, that's because um, what happens within a particular section of the coast, and in this case, we're looking right here at, uh, at Poverty Bay, uh, Turanga Nui Akiwa, um, but it, it really matters is what happens directly offshore. So the, the ruptures up here almost have no effect to the tsunami down here. It's just what happens directly offshore of, of where you're standing. And that's, that's something that's been observed in tsunami science or, and noted for you know, 20, 30 years. Going back to the field surveys we did in the 90s where, where it, it, there was a huge amount of destruction directly in front of where the biggest amount of earthquake deformation was, but 20, 30 kilometers up the coast, almost nothing happened. Now looking at the deeper, uh, the deeper ruptures, so again, the idea here is that we look at one where it happens directly offshore and another one where we extend the length. And while there is some difference in the inundation, it's really not that, that big of a difference by even you know, making the earthquake much, much bigger. It all boils down to how much deformation happens right off your doorstep. So if you think about that in terms of probabilities and things, the, the, we can't determine probabilistically whether or not the rupture is going to happen more concentrated here or more concentrated here, you know, on differences of two to three to five hundred kilometers. You just cannot resolve that. So as far as we know, it's all equally likely anywhere, you know, along that, that uh, segment of the, of the subduction zone. So now I went and started looking at the Japan source. So this is one of the source models that was proposed for Japan. It's been changed multiple times. This is actually the first one that came out back when the, the tsunami first happened. And these numbers are the amount of displacement on each one of these little segments. So, and again, remember that those two segments are dropping down into the, into the crust of the earth. So this one's shallower out here and it's deeper down here. So there's a you know, greater than 20 meters slip in this, these three areas and then you know, just a little bit here and 12 up here and a little bit up there. Um, and if you take that source and put it in, you know, we get inundation, extreme, extreme inundation through Poverty Bay, and, uh, and which is, you know, on par with what happened in Japan, of course. Now, I just put these two side by side. These two maps are scaled identically. So this is Sendai um, in Japan, and then this is, you know, Pox Bay and Poverty Bay and Mahia here. So just to show in terms of scale, what the two areas look like if you scaled them up exactly next to each other. The blue areas are the areas that were inundated by the 2011 tsunami. So that's how far it went in. And, um, you know, it was five kilometers. And this is the, you know, what it looked like the Sendai airport was completely flooded and all through the plain. So this is a, a low-lying coastal area, very similar I think to the Poverty Bay Flats, the flatland in of uh, Hawks Bay and whatnot, and um, and so you know the five kilometers amount of inundation that we got from our models, you know, unsurprisingly matches the five kilometers inundation that was 
seen in that the real event because the geographies are similar, the earthquake size was, was the same that I used to simulate it. So in the end, our, um, the design source, if you will, for this was a, was a 300 by 100 kilometer long fault, which we shifted either slightly south or slightly north to cover the whole Tidafati East Cape region. And we used a uniform slip because again, we can't, we can't make, you, you can make all the detailed scenarios that you want with detailed slip distributions and whatnot, and, and that's of course possible, but you, you're never gonna be sure that, that w that's what's gonna happen. So it's better to basically sort of turn up the, turn up the gain on your whole simulation and, and put an average value of slip in the whole thing to sort of cover all those possibilities in one model. And um, that's, that's, how, that's the approach that we used. So we tried it with 15, 20, and 25 meter slip, and basically at each one of the coastal communities along the shoreline, we made sure we were hitting that target um, 2,500 year return period tsunami height, and then use the inundation from that. And these are all for our local source events. Now, going into the far field for, the, for that orange zone, the middle zone. Um, so looking at um, events from South America, you know, th this is an area we know pops off huge earthquakes every couple hundred years. 1960 was down here. Uh, that was a magnitude 9.4, uh, or yeah, in that range, nine, bigger than nine, huge earthquake. If somewhere came like that from the south. At the Chile-Peru border region, 1868 was another huge earthquake. Um, that was the one that made seven, seven to seven meter change in water level in Littleton Harbor in the, on the South Island. Um, but uh, if you look in the historical accounts, it really didn't do a whole lot in the North Island, or the accounts weren't that good. Um, there's been other ones going back 1600s in this area. Uh, Central Peru has had some big earthquakes. And um, again, we're going back hundreds of years. But if I ran, so in between each one of these red lines, I put an identical earthquake and source. And then I ran it all the way through and computed the tsunami height here where we're standing at the Gisborne tide gauge. And I took the largest um, positive value and the largest negative value and then just divided it by a uniform number so that the biggest one comes out to one. And the idea is to just show which parts of the subduction zone, so these are all numbered one through 18 down here, and you go one through 20 across there, so one is this one up here, and 20 is that one down there. And you can see which segments of the subduction zone produce sort of the biggest bang over here. And the ones that are the strongest are um, around the five, six region, so this area, and the, um, the uh, 10, number 10s, pretty strong, and then 14, 15 regions. So, so we've got basically this area, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, the central area, and then from the south. And then in between, they don't quite have the same impact. But um, they, so those are some of the ones, the regions that we focused on for sending across the, the, strongest, uh, the strongest tsunami. And you can see what the propagation patterns look like across the Pacific, and they, they change quite a bit. Each one of those white lines is a, uh, a one hour travel time, so that's how long it takes the wave to go one, or how far the wave goes in one hour, oops, sorry. And if you, um, you know, count those out, we've got about 14 or 12 of them, 12 to 14 hours before it hits our coast. Um, so we looked at a number of these. Now, well I did, um, we did the whole East Coast, I'm just showing uh, a couple of highlights, so our region and uh, Tolaga um, area. So looking at the inundation from each one of these scenarios, and as I, I went through them all, we simulated, we simulated them all and then calculated the inundation from each one, several sets of these. Um, and, um, and the idea is at the end of that, you aggregate all these inundation zones, and, and that's what defines your overall inundation area. So um, the final um, inundation areas, so the, 
This is the red, is, that's the two meter, basically two meters above mean high water spring. That's, so this is all very low lying area here and that's why it's under the, the, um, the red zone. Then the orange is that intermediate and then that's the, uh, from that, those distant events aggregated together. And then the yellow is um, the worst case local event um, based either on, on the um, near source 10, 5, 15, 20, or 25 meter slip cases. See, um, so yeah, quite a bit of potential inundation going up the rivers and um, straight across the, across the lowlands. Let's see, so we put together these animations for, for you all, for GDC, and just for visualization tools to show what it is. Now the time is going across the bottom here, so that's one hour now. And there's the second wave coming in just after uh, hour and a half. And then the thing keeps going, because basically Poverty Bay uh, resonates, so the energy comes in and then the, the energy gets trapped inside the bay and then basically bounces around and, and stays there. When I zoom in on the port area in downtown, so this one on the right, that's the flow depth, so that's the depth of the water over the ground, whereas the one on the left is the total tsunami height. Um, yeah, it, it's sobering, it, it, um, and it's also quite sped up, as you, you know, going through six hours of real time in less than a minute. But, um, but yeah, mul you can expect multiple waves and, um, and yeah, widespread destruction. Now, one of the things that's been talked about uh, and worried about is, is the effect of um, logs and debris. Um, it is a big deal. It happens, it's happened in a lot of past tsunami events. And um, it, it, what happens is that the, you know, the, what comes barreling through the streets is no longer actually water anymore. It's, it's, this debris, it's a debris flow. It's full of all the stuff that it's picked up along the way. And if you see the videos from Banda Aceh in 2004, uh, it's very clear that you can just see this in, in effect. And then it's just this moving, bulldozer of, of, um, of just things that are contained within the water. Um, so it's boats, it's houses, it's, it's trees, all that. Um, the port has uh, a lot of logs stored in different places. And, what we, and then of course the beach is always covered with lots of driftwood and big chunks of log out, out there. Um, we, uh, we put them into the model, so as individual little floating particles or particles that can float. So then took the output from the, the hydrodynamics or the wave simulation, and they're able to pick up these pieces and then move them around the, the model grid. It's, um, and, and you can see where things go and where, and where they end up. So the output for these types of plots, it's not the clearest, but what this basically shows is this is the number of visits. So you, as the model runs, you count how many times a particular point in the model is visited by one of the seed particles from the starting point. And so if it's, when it's a high number, 10,000 visits, you, you know, that place has a lot of concentration of debris at the end of the model run. But we see, so most of this, a lot of it stays close. A lot of it gets caught by the breakwater and stays in the port area. Like these ones here, they never moved because the, the water didn't really get up in there. And that's why it stayed black. But then these ones get pushed away. And you know, you, you see that logs and such get pushed into town and um, trapped on, um, or can go up the rivers and could be trapped. We don't have bridges in the simulation, but they could be trapped on the pilings of the bridge. And we saw this after the rains back in, um, in uh, March, was it? Uh, I remember coming down and you know, the guys were pulling the giant tree trunks out of, off the bridge. Um, so that, that, that is another thing that, that happens. And so one of the secondary effects that Dave alluded to is actually the piling up of debris on the bridge, which then if you have water coming can actually lead to failure of the bridge um, after the fact. 
Um, so that was for a uh, local source. And this is for one of the distant source cases. We did it for all the different things, but there's a bit more of a, of a spread on the distant source for where the material can go. Then looking at the, this is for the, now we're looking at material along the beach. So the material along the beach, and this is for one of the local sources. And a lot, you see a lot more gets up into the town area. And it's also the driftwood is spread all, all through, through the town. And then a distant source um, is a lot less, this particular scenario is less sort of spread of all this material, but still a lot of it gets pushed up into, into, the, into the town beach behind town. The other thing that was looked at in our study was the effect of um, erosion. So we used a, a sediment transport model, or, or a, a model that's able to basically say how much material gets moved based on how fast the water is moving. So um, this is what the topography looks like at the start of the, of the run. Um, so the green is, is zero to two meters, and then as we get higher, we get into the five and six meter range. And the red is now areas that have been eroded away, so those go down. So the one meter of material has been stripped away and pulled back out and deposited offshore, probably uh, from the return flows. And when you put those together, this is what the end topography looks like. So remember, the green is actually lower. It's a bit counterintuitive in the plot. But so these areas have all been stripped away and are been eroded away. And um, that, that's not unlike stuff I've seen in the field from, from real tsunami events, um, where you have extreme erosion along the coastline and material deposited um, inland. So finally, to conclude, we're actually ahead of time. Um, we did an inundation assessment to comply with the DGL um, director's guidelines. And our, consider, our study considered distant, regional, and local source tsunami. Uh, we had to define our three evacuation zones, the yellow zone based on sources producing tsunami heights with about a 2,500 year recurrence interval. Um, and it, you know, we, we showed, as has been seen in lots of different tsunami studies, that the nature of the inundation depends heavily on the details of the earthquake rupture. So where it happens, the amount of slip, it really influences how much inundation happens at a particular point along the coast. And the middle orange zone was based on large distant source events, uh, predominantly from South America. Well, we did look at some Central America. And other work that we've done showed that you know, things from Alaska and Japan are, are much, much smaller for an equivalent-sized earthquake. Um, and the lowest hazard is that red zone. And that was just mapped based on the LIDAR topography where it was available. And it's the two meter contour above mean high water spring. And we also considered the erosion of beaches uh, due to the extreme tsunami flow and the dispersal of the debris. These are areas, the debris in particular is something that we could be looked at in, in more detail um, to understand better and maybe you know, talk with the, the port, how this can be mitigated, et cetera. So uh, that's it, thanks.